Welcome back to Oregon Encounters. As we continue our journey through the 1800s, we are going to be moving throughout time as well as to different geographic locations. Here, we're in Nevada. The fur trapping era has come to a close, but they have set the trail for new travelers coming across in canvas wagons, like the one behind me. Now, we're not going to get too detailed about maps and which country laid claim to which part of land during this time period, because the shape of the United States changed a lot between 1840 and 1850. What's important to remember is that indigenous people have always lived on the land. When the US government called the land in the West free for the taking, it wasn't really free for the taking. And indigenous people would say, absolutely not. We'll learn more about this in our next chapter. But for now, let's talk with an immigrant who appears to be midway on her journey to Oregon. Thank you for halting your travels to talk with us today. Can you tell us a little bit more about who you are, where you're from, and where you're headed? My pleasure. Any reason for a rest day at this point in the journey is welcomed. My name is Elizabeth, and my husband and I are from Iowa. We both grew up tending to our family's land and had a small farm with our four children where we grew corn, beans, and wheat. We're headed to Oregon, we're hoping to use our seeds to start our own farm where the soil is rich and the rain is plentiful. The children are hoping for an apple tree in our new land. Forgive me for asking, but it sounds like you're leaving a well-established life in Iowa. Can you say more about what you're hoping to find? Yes, we were close to family, but the land was not productive in terms of crops and farming. We've been promised that the soil in the Willamette Valley will not only be easier to work, but also give us twice the volume of crops. When we get to Oregon, my husband and I will claim 640 acres of land, making for a much larger property than we had in Iowa. The amount of land, the ease of labor, and chance to provide more for our growing family were all reasons we wanted to sell our farm and travel west. Oh, you're expecting a baby. Does that give you any concern while you're traveling each day? Oh, not at all. Life goes on here as it does at home. Daily chores such as cooking breakfast and dinner at camp, along with laundry on rest days like today, must get done. The children found setting camp up each night exciting at first, but now have settled into a routine and have learned how to help and how to stay out of harm. I'm fortunate to still have all my babes, but two took ill with cholera and we were prepared to lose them. Thankfully, they have regained strength and now resumed walking the daily distance and tending to the sheep and the pigs. That's great to hear. From what I understand, you're quite lucky to not have any other deaths among your family. Aside from diseases like cholera, what are some other challenges or dangers you face? The wagon has been something to be cautious of once the oxen team is harnessed. There have been several children walking too close to the wagon who have fallen and been accidentally harmed by the wheels or gotten underfoot of animals. Wild animals, of course, are something to be aware of, especially when the boys explore away from the camp and try to hunt for rabbits and gophers, but find a rattler instead. Exploring is about the only thing to keep them entertained, but I've told them to leave berries and other unknown plants alone in this foreign land. The most anxious I have felt has been the water crossings. They have scared me so much, we decided to change course at Fort Hall to avoid crossing the Snake and Columbia River. Instead, we have joined a wagon troop entering Oregon from the south along the Applegate Trail. Oh, we're not currently on the Oregon Trail? No, there are several routes that have become established after crossing the Rocky Mountains at South Pass. Many travelers are not Oregon bound, but have continued west to the Sierra Nevada mountains toward the gold fields of California. After we cross the Black Rock Desert, we will continue across the Sagebrush Desert to Oregon City. We still have springs to drink from and rivers to cross, but we will not have to risk our lives on the Columbia River. This desert crossing does give me some concern, as dry and desolate as it may be. A few days of rest to gather water and feed for livestock will give us a better chance of survival. It sounds like you have a lot to do before you cross the desert. How many miles across is it? And how does that compare to how many miles you usually walk in a day? I've been told the desert crossing is further than we would travel in the best of conditions, upwards of 20 miles. Typically, we cover about 10 to 15 each day. We have been traveling for about four months and still have many weeks of travel before we reach Oregon City. We hope to cross the Cascade Mountains before the snow falls. A lot still to do. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. 
As you might imagine, not everyone's experiences traveling to Oregon was the same. Money, education, and community all factored in to the odds of whether or not an individual would survive the journey. There are many stories to explore, but one that we'd like to share with you is the story of Letitia Carson. Letitia Carson was an African-American woman who traveled across to Oregon on the Oregon Trail. Return to the video list on the Oregon Encounters page to find the video titled Oregon Trail Reflections. <laughs> 